Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Africa Wednesday. As always, I'm your host, Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about the Africa 2017 Forum that just took place in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. A forum is a great place for leaders and business people to get together and agree on things that are common knowledge to the rest of us. For example, this forum decided that development is good and needs to happen in Africa. Great! Now that we've got that settled, how are we going to do that? Three separate strategies were discussed that we will go into today. Fueling startups, cross-border trade, and expanding Chinese investment. So let's get started with entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is hailed as a key driver for economic growth in Africa and creating an enabling environment for businesses to thrive is paramount to ensure long-term sustainability. This was highlighted during the 2017 Business for Africa Forum in Egypt, which brought together business leaders and entrepreneurs from across the continent. Okay, great. So let's start with the leader of that discussion, definitely not black person, Ben White. He was the founder of venture capitalist firm VC4 Africa, a company in charge of raising awareness that people in Africa do things besides starve. He argues that there's a huge lack of access from talented African entrepreneurs to finance because of a complete lack of visibility. So the question here becomes, how do you attract venture capitalists? And more importantly, is it a good idea to stake your future on startup culture? First, let's talk about looking at startups and thinking that is where you're going to really get the improvement going. Well, according to Entrepreneur Magazine, there's a negative relationship between rates of entrepreneurship and levels of per capita income, confirmed by Gallup studies, the U.S. Census Bureau, and the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And that's from the Entrepreneur Magazine. That would be like ISIS releasing propaganda saying, maybe give Christianity a second chance. Now that coupled with the fact that according to This Is Africa, internationally 92% of startups fail each year. And more importantly, according to a global entrepreneurship report from 2014, the business discontinuation rate in Africa is the highest by quite a margin. And quite a margin it is, with Africa closing businesses at about three times the rate of second place, South America. So now that I tempered your expectation a little bit, let's look at the potential of Africa's entrepreneurial markets. Oddly enough, about 40% of Africa's e-commerce startups are in Nigeria. So why are entrepreneurs the future of Africa? Well, according to Quartz magazine, there is a case study in which, in 2011, the Nigerian finance minister launched a business plan financing competition in which $58 million were given away in grants to 1,200 entrepreneurs who could use the startup money to start a new business or expand an existing one. Now Republicans, if you're thinking to yourself, well maybe that money could have been better used if they had given it to the rich. Nigeria tried that experiment too. Nigeria to be specific, where a court has seized $21 million from bank accounts linked to the former oil minister. Officials of Nigeria's anti-corruption agency uncover a huge pile of cash. 43 million US dollars stuck in hundreds of neatly wrapped bundles. Yeah, did not work out too well in that case. With this entrepreneurship grant though, things are going amazingly well. In fact, a Columbia study led by Chris Blattman considered it to be one of the most effective development programs in history. So yeah, that sounds pretty good considering a lot of development has occurred since the days when our best innovation was fire. Out of 24,000 applicants, the top 480 plans in the contest were awarded $50,000 grants. Then 720 winners were randomly selected from a group of 1,200 semi-finalists to receive grants. That random selection allowed the World Bank to have a control group for unfunded projects. The startups who received the grants were 37 percentage points more likely to survive the next three years. And more importantly, they were 22.9 percentage points more likely to grow to more than 10 workers. The 7,027 jobs that were generated as a result of this program had an adjusted cost per job of some $28,136 less than government spending programs in the U.S. Because when it comes to unemployed, the U.S. apparently dumps money on them like their campaign contributors. Many justified this success by explaining that Africa's startups are so underfunded that even basic investments can blow up the market. 
it kind of makes you angry that an app that sends the word yo to other users got more than a million dollars in funding in the West. Imagine that pitch meeting. It's like texting, but worse. Anyways, that's where the push to increase investment in entrepreneurship in Africa comes from. As far as the rubber hitting the road though, Egypt is really on the cutting edge. President LC talked about the fact that, uh, that he is looking to provide more loans to the youth with minimal interest. He also lowered taxes on foreign direct investment, which is great, but maybe he might want to send the Israeli company that invested a million dollars in yo, a yo. Although you gotta hope they read it like yo and not like yo. This brings us to the issue of cross-border trade. Well, Egypt saw the Africa 2017 Business and Investment Forum as a chance to expand its trade activities with other African nations. The North African country signed a $500 million deal with Africa's Export-Import Bank to support export investments by Egyptian businesses in other African nations. Now, this particularly ties into the first problem of entrepreneurs not getting access to money because the country's borders in Africa have pretty high tariffs that are causing some major pan-African trade problems. This should come as no surprise considering there are 54 separate countries in Africa. That's a lot of borders. Now, The African Union in 2012 stated that the continent was to become a free trade zone, although the countries making up the African Union responded to their own decision by saying, you first. Currently, the average import tax on intra-African trade is 13%, which, while you might think that encourages people to buy local, actually encourages imports from economy of scale, like the US. Recently, we've seen private corporations step in though and firmly take the position, we want more money. A truly brave stance. And they're going to try to achieve that goal by pushing Africa to open up its borders and allow them to export to more countries internally. This makes the promise of lowering these barriers to trade more promising because whenever the corporations get involved, things tend to get done. The agreement mentioned at the top of this section where the president of Egypt got a $500 million export infrastructure grant with the Afrexim Bank to build the inter-country export infrastructure seems promising. Although with debt and instability going the way they are in Egypt, I think Sisi might just be looking for the fastest way to get out of the country. Lastly, we come to China. China has shown confidence in Africa as a major development partner. In 2015, Chinese President Xi Jinping pledged $60 billion worth of investments in the continent. And the session focused on how to tap on the benefits of the relationship. China was all over this event, sending representatives, reporters, consultants. Don't worry though, the US was represented there too. Oh wait, uh, nope. And let me tell you, they were throwing all sorts of shade at us behind our backs. If you ask me to summarize the different approach, the Western approach has been given to Africa and the Chinese approach. I have this kind of tiger uh, analysis. If you have a tiger in, uh, in front of you, the traditional Western approach telling Africa, when you have the tiger in front of you, what do you do? You get your laptop, analyze it, the characteristic carefully of the tiger, and then discuss your, with your colleague, how are you going to conquer the tiger? The problem is this approach, when you finish that analysis or study, the tiger might be gone. You are probably being eaten by the tiger. The Chinese approach is very different. If they have a tiger in front of them, they jump on top of the tiger, they ride it. Now I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in saying this, but if the problem with the current administration was overthinking things, I'd be pretty happy. We jump on top of that tiger and start throwing stones at the nearby hibernating bear. That woman was the leader of the Made in Africa initiative, by which rising labor costs in China are predicting to see them sending about 85 million jobs to Africa, which predictively gives them quite a lot of sway over local governments. She spoke at many of the open forums and made that analogy maybe too many times. This consensus of the event was, let's stop doing business with the West and keep doing business with China, specifically trying to get as much as possible out of their One Belt One Road initiative and this new job export potential. Africa Business reported, 
While African approaches to Chinese involvement differ, a strong consensus was reached regarding the need to coordinate efforts to make the most out of Chinese investment in technological transfers. Americans definitely were not feeling the love at this event, but don't worry, none of us know about it, so no harm, no foul. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hey Internet, if you enjoyed this episode of Africa Wednesday and don't want to miss future videos, please help me secure advertisers by clicking the subscribe button below and clicking the like button. We have some more of our Africa Wednesday videos on this playlist right here. If you're a podcast listener and you would like to see my library of over 50 podcasts, click on the link below to go to my podcast site and subscribe. Thank you, and as always, that's all I have to say about that.